years ago. So I've been, uh, I guess, in my work life, I guess about 25 uh, plus years. Uh, started off as a systems engineer and a systems architect and then moved into program management. I've been doing program management for a number of years. And for me, program management is all about simpl simplifying the complex. And I think that's what architects do, is they take complex problems and help us to simplify and see it in a new way, in a way that we can actually uh, solve problems. And at our company, we try to solve some of the hardest problems there are out in the, out in the world. So with that, I'd like to give you an overview of a little bit about Raytheon. Uh, Raytheon UK is a subsidiary, and then I'll turn it over to Brian Lell to talk a little bit about um, how we see business architects and systems architects. All right, so next slide. Okay, so a little bit about our company, if you don't know uh, about Raytheon, but um, we, uh, in 2017, uh, we, we, we uh, generated about $25 billion in turnover, um, 64,000 employees, and our headquarters is in Boston, so uh, U.S. company, uh, Heritage, uh, is, is really uh, started in, in the Boston area with MIT. Some of the uh, key inventions and things that we, we are part of uh, was we invented the microwave oven, uh, we also invented uh, we also invented radar as well, uh, you know, in World War II. So, so company has a long heritage since the 1920s, and uh, in the UK we actually have a heritage all the way till about 1902. In that we had a similar company called AC Coster that developed the melting maker radio and also helped out with uh, World War II in terms of the British uh, chain defense in World War II. So, so very interesting company and we've got over 15,000 contracts globally. So we work on a variety of things and I'll talk on the next slide about some of the missionaries that we work on. Um, so we are well known for our radar solutions, uh, known well as a radar company. Um, we've got five companies in essence. Um, but the, uh, uh, we've been well known for some of our brands in terms of Patriot and Missile Defense Solutions in uh, integrated defense <coughs> systems in the northeast of the U.S. in the Boston area. Uh, that's where we developed some of the biggest large-scale radars um, um, out there. And um, in IIS, Intel and Information Services, uh, we provide training solutions. We also provide um, cyber security uh, solutions. We are actually responsible as a company uh, for protecting .gov. I mean, that website and, and the largest uh, DOD uh, and Homeland Security uh, contract for cyber. So, uh, very uh, diverse company. Uh, missile systems, where Brian and I um, have come from and grown up, um, we provide um, um, a variety of effectors uh, and interceptors uh, uh, throughout the world for many countries. Uh, space and airborne systems provided radar for both space and airborne platforms. And finally, Forcepoint, which we bought uh, a few years ago as a part of a, a joint acquisition. Um, so that, that company provides products and software security products for over 150 organizations and has some of the leading software uh, for protecting our networks. Um, so a little bit about Raytheon UK. So I've been a part of the subsidiary for about three and a half years. Uh, we have a variety of locations. The last few years, we've actually opened up a couple uh, cyber innovation centers, uh, one in Gloucester, one in Manchester. So the company is significantly investing in this subsidiary. Uh, we've got 1,600 employees here. Um, our spin actually helps uh, drive about 10,000 jobs here in the UK. 700 uh, million pound turnover on an annual basis. Um, we're investing about 20 million uh, pounds per, per year in research and development. We've spent over 250 million in the last 10 years. So, so significant driver to prosperity. Um, we've got multiple areas that you can see. Um, I lead the defense portfolio, which has uh, both effectors, uh, complex weapons, and manufacturing of subsystems. Uh, but we also do GPS denied solutions, including anti-jam solutions. 
Uh, we are well known here in the UK for our uh, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance. We, book, we deliver the Sentinel platform, which does wide area surveillance for the Royal Air Force, uh, as well as, uh, as tactical asset as well. So, you know, the, the Royal Air Force is celebrating the centenary. We're part of that this year, um, because we're a key enabler in their success, and for now and for the future. I talked a little about cyber intelligence, but that business has grown significantly for us. Uh, we've got two uh, cyber innovation uh, centers uh, in the West Country um, and in the Northwest in Manchester. Though that business is growing significantly in terms of employees. We've got about 200 employees there. And finally, uh, we have a Canadian division called Ernst Lights Canada. So it, it has its heritage from Leica, um, and it provides some of the the precision optical systems throughout uh, for our rifle sites and for our front end systems. So, uh, very interesting portfolio. Uh, Raytheon is really, uh, in the last few years, uh, switching to a more global company. Uh, so, Raytheon UK is one of four subsidiaries. Um, so, we have Raytheon Emirates, Raytheon Arabia, and also Raytheon Australia. So. Four subsidiaries and part of the U.S. company, um, but we are moving more to a global company that's trying to provide innovative solutions to make the world a safer place. Um, and we're finding that those ideas are coming everywhere um, and, and, and throughout the world, and so we are put, increasing our presence in, in its key markets where we see uh, major growth. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about my experience with system architecture. Um, I'm not a certified system architect, but I actually started as a system architect, system engineer. Um, I took a lot of the classwork, the traditional um, architect, architecture framework classes that uh, many of you probably have taken or have interest in. And um, so there's always been a demand for systems architects in, in large complex programs and, and portfolio uh, kind of product line solutions um, in multiple domain areas. The, the thing that's changing for us is, is we're seeing that we have to build solutions that are in multiple cross, in multiple domains. Uh, for example, uh, we're building things that you know start off as an air solution, goes to a land solution, or you need something that, that crosses those domains. And so we're building both defensive and offensive solutions in some cases. <coughs> Uh, that, that have multiple uses. There's a premium for seeing how much more value we can get from our solutions in a quicker uh, time frame. I mean, there's a big demand for rapid solutions, solutions that may only offer um, half of the capability at half the cost. I mean, there's a lot of discussions. And then we feel as a company that, that we can uh, help our customers go to uh, rapid development, rapid capabilities for solutions because sometimes the warfighter needs those solutions rapidly. And um, but what's also changed is is there's a because of the complexity of, of large capacity and large scale, and our company has grown significantly over that uh, over the last uh, 20 years that I've been involved in the company. Um, that that the, the the thing is is that. We've got uh, suppliers in, in many countries, we have customers in many countries, and we have supply chains in, in, uh, in a, around the world, really a global supply chain. And that really demands us to look at how do we best determine a commercial solution, technical solution, and, and a business solution um, um, that, that provides the customer what he or she needs. And, and so we are employing business architects uh, to help knit the company together, knit our supply chain so that we're truly one team for the customer. And we're able to talk about reach back solutions both in the US and in other markets. So, you know, I before we kind of thought of markets as singular, and now we're looking at markets in multiple markets, taking some solutions that are developed overseas back into the US aerospace and defense market. And, and so I see a, a really big demand for business architects, systems architects. I mean, we're always recruiting for systems architects, but also business architects. Um, we're, we're involved in uh, business transformation, as many companies are. We're always looking at seeing how we can upgrade our infrastructure, our technologies, internally and externally, uh, to meet customer demands. 
and uh, customer opportunities. And so, so with that, I'd like to introduce Brian Lell. So I've worked with Brian for a number of years, so he'll talk a little bit more, and then we'll take some questions. Thanks, Brian. All right, that was a great intro, and uh, the one thing I'll add to Steve's introduction is I also leave the business architectural work stream under the architectural forum, and you'll see a little bit of that at the end of the room today, and then you'll see a lot more of it when I dive much deeper into an architecture case study tomorrow. So this is a quick view of architecture of Raytheon. Our architecture lead for Raytheon, we're all seekers, is back here in the audience. We're all the other way. Um, we have a certified architect program which is accredited by the Open Group. There's not very many companies that have done that. Raytheon is one of them, and the only defense company that has done so. So you see a, a quote by Steve up there that we, that we show around. Um, so we use that for many purposes, as Roy mentioned. That yes, there is enterprise architecture that is primarily focused on guiding your information technology investments as we're going into the incredible growth of technology that you heard about over the last two or three years this morning and managing that complexity. But we also use enterprise architecture as a strategy tool. And so some of you might wonder, why would we want to have Roy, one of our executives, get up and talk about the markets, the business growth, the globalization? I would say if you as a business architect don't understand those business strategy elements, you're not doing business architect. So that's why it's important to work with your leaders and understand where you're going strategically, markets, products, geographical regions, and so forth. So we use our architecture for all of these different uh, types of purposes. So this is really our last slide. I will spend a few minutes on it, and then we're going to come back to it tomorrow and dive deeply into the case study. You heard the announcement this morning about the TOGAF 9.2 update and that some of those significant updates were in the business architecture space. You see those on the left side, bringing and escalating the use of business models as a way in which to more articulately understand the strategy and put it into a framework. That is now the phase A and vision phase where it belongs to be able to help the enterprise architect understand who's driving the company, where's the company you need to go, what is it that needs to shape and set the scope for your enterprise architecture efforts. If you go further down on the left, we then introduce business capabilities. The descriptions in a framework that can say, here is your ability to do things as a company. Having a standard framework or business capability map that can be used for everything your company does, and then be able to start to establish heat against that business capability map to assess where is your strategy driving you that then says we need to improve and grow some of our capabilities as an organization or a business or an agency. And then finally, we put a significant introduction to value streams in TOGAF 9.2, or the activities your company or business must go through to be able to provide value to a set of stakeholders. The business capabilities and value streams are also in a set of guides. They're now part of the TOGAF ecosystem to dive deeper and give examples about how to do these business capability maps, model your value streams, and literally be able to get that secret formula that was missing in the past of being able to translate from business strategy down to why you're doing things as an architect and what that architecture means, model back up and map back up the business strategy. So tomorrow I will go through a case study where we have used these methods and principles in an area called sales and operations planning. Some of you that are in commercial companies have probably been doing sales and operations planning for a while and say, well, why is this an interesting case study? It's been around for a long time. Well, in some sectors, like the defense sector, it hasn't been around for very long, but it took us a while to learn. In sales and operations planning, one of the reasons it's such an interesting case study for business architecture it is, is it is a value stream. It is a fundamental new way of delivering value with the resources and capabilities you already have in your company and be able to understand how can we address a business model that says we must get significantly more efficient as we go global. We have a global supply chain. We have a growing number of resources. If you're in a growth market, like we are in the defense sector, and your supply chain is growing, you can't grow the old way of doing business to be able to succeed in that growth. You have to be able to achieve the growth while using your resources in a better way. 
sales and operations planning is the answer to do that. It's a value stream approach. Then we'll go through the business capability map, what the capability gaps were to be able to achieve that sales and operations planning practice. And then look at uh, how that gives you a portfolio planning strategy. And then look at an example of how to map value streams to business capabilities. And the great thing about once your organization is able to get to the point of understanding your key value streams, understanding your business capability framework, and be able to map from one to the other, you then have closed that loop. You'll be able, you're able to trace from business strategic drivers the value you're trying to achieve and the stakeholder you're trying to achieve for, how that maps to capability gaps in your business, and then go with the best to fill those business capability gaps with traceability all the way back up to why those are the most strategic things to do. So that's the, that's the relevance of the business architecture updates to TOGAF and the associated guides that come as part of the business. So with that, I think I will close for questions. A few questions about coming in. Uh, do Raytheon's and TOGAF certifications provide a competitive advantage in union contracts? Brian, you want to start? Um, some of our contracts are actually architecture contracts that we work with. So I think there have been certain one cases where uh, some of our intelligence and cyber is like, uh, that's where the raw comes from, uh, where we're, we're hired to do architecture. We're hired to do an open architecture approach to an intelligence or surveillance system or something like that. So absolutely, it's been a competitive discriminator in cases. Okay, thank you. Um, Yes, and this is more for you, Brian, but what's your view on using the Archimate standard that is now the preferred architecture modeling technique in the NATO architecture framework version 4? Well, part of being a business architect is that in one way in which it's different from other levels, levels of architecture, such as the long history of solution architecture that Roy was talking about, is business architecture is compared to applications, infrastructure, data, and information. Business comes first before the word architecture. And I say that to then say, I think Archimate can be a great enabler, but only if it is able to provide a, long, uh, a valuable notation, which helps address the real business needs as done by business architecture. If it just provides a formalism that is fun for architects, but doesn't get to the business needs, it's useless. Business first, which is what business we've, first. we've heard all that. So you, you were talking about the history of solution architectures and how um, you've seen a growing business need for, for architecture and, and putting these pieces together. Do you see that in being demanded from, from customers or is it more of an internal thing that the organization is recognizing? I, I think it's both. I mean, it's, there's tremendous demand internally and externally. And with our partners, because we, you know, we do work with a number of both supply chain uh, partners and teammates on significant solutions. And so there's demand. Um, it's kind of interesting, you know. We've had this discussion. Is sometimes, at times, we uh, don't apply as much rigor on our internal solutions as we should on our external ones for our customers. And so, so uh, having a a architect really helps us make sure that there's. Uh, a, a good understanding of the interfaces, the requirements, the, the pieces, and understanding the whole picture versus rushing into something. And so I like the, the framework, but there's a demand both internally and externally for architects. Then the hard part is we just can't find enough of them. I mean, I think uh, the industry, I'm glad to see there's a significant interest in this uh, forum, but um, I, I know Brian and I mean Rolf could probably talk about it a little bit as well. But you know, as part of our need for more and more engineers, it includes needing uh, systems architects and and uh, business architects, and so there's a tremendous demand. Uh, I think so in terms of career uh, opportunities for those fields. Yeah, that's that's good to hear. I know uh, you acknowledged Rolf earlier, but Rolf's been there. Uh, Coming to the open group for a long time, and I remember uh, seeing him talk more than once on the, uh, the profession, the architecture uh, structure within Raytheon, and how important it is. So, uh, thank you for all your efforts, Rolf, over the years. 
Um, next question. Um, how important is it to have buy-in at exec level to drive EA across the business to a plain real value? I, I think it's very important. I think, um, uh, I, I guess, um, as, as, as Brian was talking about, um, we, um, you know, we, there's so much competition for resources and investments, right? And so, so um, as we make uh, major investments, whether it's in technology or internally, I mean, uh, we, we do need to look at the architecture. And I, I just realized, uh, I was thinking about it even uh, past few days ago, we, we built a new, uh, uh, and basically moved into a new location, the 25 million pound investment. We've been in that facility at Cato Park in Harlow, Essex uh, for three years. And so it was a significant investment, but you know, there was a lot of discussions on architecture and, and uh, a lot of discussions on, well, will the site work for what we need it to do? And then how, do, how does it have connectivity to our other sites? You know, because we have six or seven sites. And so, so architecture is a part of all of that. And, and I think, um, I, you know, I'd encourage, um, you know, the architects to, 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 to push, push your uh, uh, ideas and your input early into our decision making process. I had another PC in addition to what Roy said, and that is I read a lot of articles or blogs about how do you sell enterprise architecture. And my experience is you don't. You go work on the business strategy team and you apply enterprise architecture. And when you're executive team applying enterprise architecture to solve business strategy problems, you don't need to sell it. You prove it, prove it by doing, delivering something about it. Yeah, and I think that's a good point is that that when you look at the company strategy as a whole, um, you know, that enterprise architecture can help make sure we're tied into um, both our facility strategies, our investments, our infrastructure strategies, our people strategies, they're all tied back to the overall uh, company strategy. And, and oftentimes, um, you know, the, the enterprise architect will be the one that will they'll reemphasize the need to go back to the business strategy versus looking at other things, right? Perfect. Well, gentlemen, you can't bring us back on time exactly for lunch, so uh, we'll, we'll leave it there. And um, Wade Olson and Brian Dale, thank you both very much.